about the greatest story that was ever told in the history of the world. Amen. It's about the greatest man that ever walked on planet Earth. Amen. And it comes from the greatest book that was ever written. Amen. They spent millions of dollars trying to prove it wrong, but Amen. it was inspired by God. Amen. Holy men that was inspired by the Holy Spirit that wrote the words of God, the words of life. Today, today, I'm impressed to speak to you about there is no greater love, Amen. no greater love than the love of King Jesus. That's why the tomb is empty. That's why the tomb is empty. He loves us all. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, our shepherd, you shall not want, but truly, you are our provider, you are our keeper, you are our restorer, you are everything that we need, Lord. There's nothing that you can't do. So we look through the heavens to the hills of which come without help because we find out we try to do it on our own, dear Father. We can't do it. We can't do it on our own. You said it in your word. We can do nothing without you. So we look through the heavens, dear Father, and hold on to your unchanging hand and thank you for everything you've done. You brought us here safely this morning. That's enough. You've given us life and breath, dear Father. That's enough. We've done everything you wanted to do for us, dear Lord. So bless this congregation, dear Lord, and bless each soul and those who are hurting Dear Father, let your spirit dwell within them. Let them know that there's a God who has all power in his hand. And he will be still in the healing business. So bless us, I pray, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let the church say amen. 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 When I was a little boy, I was no stranger to getting a whooping. This thing right here between my nose and my chin kept me in trouble. Mama would always say, she said, boy, I'm going to tell your daddy on you. And I said, uh-oh. Because I was scared of my dad as a bear. He was about this high. And he, I was just, he just, when I see him, I just start trembling because I know, I know what's going to happen. He said, boy, when you come into the house, he said, boy, I'm going to beat the devil out of you. And I said, I've been smiling ever since. So, daddy, so he must have beat the devil out of me. So I'm still smiling. So I'm still smiling. But the one thing I learned out of all that I went through, all the whippings and everything, one thing I learned, Daddy drove back, I moved a little closer to him. When Daddy drove back again, I moved a little closer to him. And guess what? Next thing I know, I was in Daddy's arms. Amen. Scripture said, you draw nigh to God, and you draw nigh to you. God is in the blessing business. Jesus says, if you ask, you shall receive. Receive. In John 18, 37, Jesus said, to this end, I was born into the world. And for this cause came I into the world, one, to do the will of his Father. heavenly Father, two, to bring light into a what kind of world? Dark world. Three, to bear witness of the what? The truth. Jesus came to bear witness of the truth. Four, to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Four, to fulfill the law and the prophets. To fulfill the law and the prophets. Five, he, to give his life as a ransom for us for this fallen world. Six, to die. Amen. Jesus came into the world to die. He promised to send us a comforter. He promised to prepare us to go back and escort us back into the Garden of Eden. Jesus promised these things. He gave us instruction book how to be, be, be ready so when the Holy Spirit come upon us, we'd be ready to go home. Amen. Escort this remnant church back to the Garden of Eden. Philippians 2 verse 8 says that our Savior Jesus Christ being found, you know that in back he found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even unto death. Even the death on the cross, the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. John 1, 13 and 14 tells us that Jesus was of his supernatural birth. Amen. And not of the will of man. Jesus was the word made flesh. Y'all know that. And the flesh dwelt among us. Jesus was God from all eternity. And yet Jesus could be our adequate savior. 
He must be human in order to suffer and die for our sin, and he must be God to make that death effective as a full payment for all of our sins. It had to be to make full payment so that Jesus will ever exist in his what kind of body? His resurrected body. His resurrected body. You will know him when you see him. You will know Jesus when you see him. For surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten of God. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes. We are healed. Someone read Revelation 5, verse 6. I got some scriptures here. We had to keep going with it. Revelation 5, verse 6. Before we got it, let's have it. Amen. All the earth. Here, Jesus represents the omnipotent power of heaven and his self-sacrificing love. He gave it all. His self-sacrificing love. The lamb as if it had been slain. The resurrected body of Jesus Christ. The resurrected body of the lamb of God. The lion of Judah. That's the Jesus that we serve, and he has been there knocking at the door Amen. all along. Amen. About age 12, Jesus was found in the temple, sitting in the midst of doctors and lawyers and teachers of the law, both hearing them, and he was asking them questions. Now, he was 12 years old. Luke 3.23 tells us that around age 27, around 27 AD, Jesus himself began to be about his father's business. He was about 30 years of age at the start of his ministry, teaching, preaching, and healing and proclaiming the good news through all of Galilee. This is what Jesus was doing. Luke tells us also that Jesus called fishermen who forsook all, both mama and papa and sister and brother, they forgot their jobs and everything. They forsook everything to follow Jesus, Amen. to follow Jesus. Amen. Remember the pioneers before the great disappointment in 1844? They had been as Christian during that time, so everything they had, for what purpose? Anybody remember? To follow Jesus, to be ready when Jesus comes. They forsook everything the world had to offer. There were so many things out there that the world had to offer. They forsook everything. As they prepare for what? The second coming of Jesus Christ. The question was asked. The question was asked. Y'all get ready now. Are we seven day Adventists today prepared to go back to heaven? It's been brought out all morning. Are we ready? We heard that again and again. Ready and willing to forsake everything we own, passing by to follow Jesus Christ. Leave our secure, well paid jobs. In our homes, we know our relationship. We know that our relationship must, with Jesus Christ, must have priority above what? Everything. Amen. Our relationship with Jesus Christ should be above everything. Whatever you're going through, whatever problem you, you think you got, our relationship with Jesus Christ should be priority. Someone read Mark 10, verse 28. Mark 10, verse 28. Here we see the handwriting on the wall. The sign of the times are happening all around us every day. Prophecy is being fulfilled right before our very eyes. The Lord, it was a song I used to sing, the Lord is coming. Are you ready? Amen. Will your heart be right if Jesus came back tonight? The Lord is coming. Are you ready? Mark 10, 28. We have everything to follow Jesus. Come on now. Lord, it's a big R and a 
big but in there. Lord, I want to follow you today, but Lord, I know you left heaven in all your glory for me to save my life, but I know the word testified that you forsook all the heaven for me, all my house and land, but I know the word testified about you, dear Lord, but They forsook all that he had. The word testified that the followers of Jesus, all his disciples, they passed, they forsook everything. Amen. And even sometimes when we get when Jesus comes into our life, we want to hold on to something. If it ain't nothing but an old handbag we used to have, it ain't nothing but an old tail we used to have, an old habit we used to have. We were talking about habits this morning. Some things you got to let them go. We will forsake, will we forsake everything you have to follow Jesus? Whatever he leads us, will we be obedient to God? God help us. The Bible tells us in John 1.29 that it was John the Baptist who looked up and saw Jesus coming. Jesus was coming. Matthew called him the son of David. Mark calls him the son of God. Luke called him the son of man. And John calls him the Lamb of God. John looked up and cried with a Lord loud voice, Behold, the Lamb of God is coming, which is taking away all the sins of the world. For it is he who will baptize us with the Holy Spirit. It is he who will baptize us. And every man, amen. Lord, I pray that we baptize us with the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is alive and well. Bible commentary. When Jesus was in the, in the wilderness, the Bible commentary says, when the enemy led man into sin, he hoped that God's adherence of sin would forever separate man from God, separate God from the earth. And when, the, when from the opening heavens, he heard a loud voice from heaven addressing his son. This is my beloved son, of whom I am well pleased. The enemy well knew the position which Christ held in heaven as the son of God, the beloved of the father, and that Christ should leave his joy and honor in heaven and come to this world as a man filled with apprehension. He know now that the time had come when his empire, his rule over the world, Satan had to give it up. It was going to be contested. His right was disputed, and he feared that his power would be broken. He knew that through prophecy, through prophecy that a kingdom was to be established, Jesus offered himself to the Father on man's behalf that those separated from God might be redeemed through the merits of Jesus Christ. Somebody needs to say amen. amen. Through the merits of Jesus Christ are we redeemed. We sang that song. Dean, my own, I can't remember. Do I have the blood of Jesus? We've been with Jesus. Amen. Oh, how I love Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew 25 tells us that after the baptism, Jesus Christ was led where? In the wilderness. He was led in the wilderness to be tempted by the tempter. So are we going to go through these things? And after Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, the Bible tells us he was a hungry. Listen to me. This is me talking. In 30 minutes, I'll be hungry. I can't go 40 days. <laughs> I go 30 minutes and I want to eat again. But when you realize that you're that hungry, who come bothering you? Hey, he come. Hey, he come. You're hungry. God. Everything starts smelling like baked tofu and veggie burgers and curry gluten. Everything. Every time you smell, you know, knowing you're hungry. Jesus Christ fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And we, as Christians, know the value of fasting. We know the value of fasting. Three times the tempter came at Jesus Christ with what? Appetite. Wealth. And worship. Worship. He wanted that worship. Woo! He didn't want that worship. 
Three times Jesus bruised his ugly head, and three times Jesus fired back with the words, with the words, said, so it is written. It is written. Three times he fired it back at him. It is written. Jesus declared it with might and power then, just as we have to declare it with his might and his power, it is written, it is written for the power is in the word of God. The power is in the spirit of God. The power is in the name of God. There is no greater love. All the things he went through, not just for himself, he did all these things for us. Jesus did it all. We sing that song, Jesus paid it all. Desire of Ages, page 122, listen to this. Christ was out in the wilderness. Of all the lessons to be learned from our Lord in the wilderness, one is to control our appetite. Yeah. Two is to control our passions. Yeah. Three is to control our desires. Yeah. I want to be somebody. I want to be rich. I want to be an uh, elder. I want to be a pastor. All these things control our desires yeah. to resist the temptation of the world. Those things that appeal to our physical nature, the natural man. That is, enemy knows that he has but what? A short time. He has a short time. But he knows that we like the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. He knows that. So the devil starts whispering in your ear, crucify Crucify Crucified, and here we are. We said it this morning. Every time, you said it, Sister Janelle, every time we do a sin or something like that, we do what? Crucified. All over again. Crucified. Because he knows every time we do it, crucified Jesus all over again. Some, will leave, some people will even receive the mark of the beast in their hand and on their forehead as a sign of relief. Whew, I don't have to run no more. Have mercy. From that time, they're going to be saying these things through persecution, not realizing that God is watching every move we make, Amen. every thought going through our head. Oof. When the seventh trumpet sounds, that will assure that their destiny terminate his and her separation from God. When probation closes, and at that time, Satan will mount his body, his head on the trophy, as a trophy on his wall, Adding to his collection of counterfeit, unfaithful, fake Christians, backsliders, and fallen saints. As the devil sings that song, another one bites the dust. Got it. Talking about Christians playing church. Jesus will tell them to their face, depart from me. <laughs> I never knew you. Separated from God. Have mercy, Jesus. Have mercy. Have mercy. Can you, I can't even imagine being separated from God. I always think about uh, how it was when I was <laughs> in school. You separate from God, you're just like a target. Mm -hmm. Everything, you separate from God, you're just like a target. Some people say when you're with God, you're a target. I believe when you're separated, you're, you're even worse of a target. Yeah. Have mercy, Jesus. Someone read John 11, 47 through 50. John 11, 30, 47 to 50. Now, this is what jealousy and selfish, unconverted hearts would do in a church. This is what they'll do in a church. Selfish, unconverted hearts. When you think you're ready for God, don't check, check yourself up against me. Check yourself up against Jesus Christ. That's how you know whether you're self-converted or not. John 40, 11, 47, verse 50. Whoever has it, please. Then gathered the chief priests and Pharisees a council and said, What do we, what do we? Mm. For this man does many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place mm. and me. Selfish, selfish, <laughs> unconverted heart. Nah. This was the church at that time. Are you listening? This was the church at that time planning and plotting and scheming and conspiring, rejecting the gospel, rejecting the truth to destroy who? Jesus. The Son of God. He would destroy Jesus. That was the whole plot. 
have mercy. You ever seen someone you knew in the church you admired, respected, loved them, just looking up to them like they was all that in a bag of chips? <laughs> the admiration by others, you looking up to them too? Just, hey, I like that guy. He dressed nice and looked nice. Till you just hate him. You almost hate to see them coming in the church door. And as soon as they open their mouth and say something like they did, like they did President Bush one time. They didn't have a gun and then they took the shoe off and threw it at him. I don't know if y'all remember that. <laughs> took the shoe off and threw it, just said, shut up. <laughs> well, that's how Caiaphas and the entourage responded when they met Jesus. Jesus was on point. He was talking the truth. He was telling the truth. And they wanted to destroy him. That's how cops were. Haters were there. Haters of truth. Haters of righteousness. Haters of everything about Christ Jesus. Someone read John 1, 10, 11, and 12. John 1, 10, 11, and 12. I got some more scriptures. John 1, verse 10, 11, and 12. I had it marked. <laughs> Amen. Haters they were. Haters of the word of God. They were haters of Jesus. They were haters of the truth. Christ's object lesson, page 314. Listen to this. That the power of God is the power to live the life of Christ. The power of God is the power to live the life of Christ. That God requires perfection of his children. Talking about us. God requires. He requires this that his law is a transcript of his character and that it is the standard of all characters. Somebody needs to say amen. That's amen. our standard. Amen. We come to church on Sabbath knowing these standards. Sometimes we say things we don't mean to say. Oh, I didn't mean to say that. Sometimes we do things we don't mean to do, but oh, I didn't mean to do that. If we hold on and maintain that standard that God has set for all of us, we wouldn't have to say, Ooh, Christ Jesus, the only way, the truth, and the life, and the light. Church, there is no greater love. Stay with me now, because I'm going somewhere with this. There is no greater love. Turn with me to Mark 8.31. I got this one. Mark 8, verse 31 says, <clears throat> and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Amen. Oh, <laughs> well, were they were separated because some of them didn't believe in resurrection and some of them didn't believe that. They were separated, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They were separated because some of them believed in resurrection and others didn't. Jesus began to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must do what? Suffer many things, not just a few, and be rejected by the elders and the chiefs and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, he'll do what? That's a song I used to love, love to sing. I'll rise again. Death can't keep me in, in the ground. And Jesus took six days. Amen. Thank you. Jesus took six days and took Brother James, John, and Peter on top of a mountain. There he was transfigured before their very eyes, shining at the sun, that's Jesus he was, talking to Moses and Elias in anticipation of his coming passion and to strengthen his disciples. He prayed with the angels that were there to strengthen his disciples. Someone find Jack, Zechariah 9, verse 9. For me, please, Zechariah 9, verse 9. I know I'm shooting them at you, but we got to do this because God wants to talk to us today. Amen. Amen. John, back around 9, verse 9, it was early that Sunday morning, the first day of the week, Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Right on time. Amen. Right on time. Jesus, what the, that song like, he's an on time guy? Yes, he is. <laughs> Amen. John, back around 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly. Behold thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having 
salvation, loading, riding upon an ass and upon a coat of his foe of an ass. Amen. Did everybody hear that? That prophesied way before Jesus was even born. Amen. Amen. Prophesied by him. He'd come riding in on a donkey and he told us. I don't like to use that three letter word, but he would come riding in on a donkey just like he promised. Never before in the earthly life of Jesus permitted, had permitted such a demonstration. Never people gathering around and they just loving, they throwing the coats on the ground and putting uh, palm leaves and stuff like this. Never before in Jesus' early life had he permitted <laughs> such a demonstration. He clearly saw, he clearly saw that this world bring, what the world would bring him. To the cross, Jesus desired to call the attention Jesus desired to call attention to his sacrifice as the redeemer of mankind, the restorer of the breach, and the sacrificial lamb of God. Jesus, know, Jesus knew that this was to crown his mission to a fallen world. And now, all eyes are on Jesus. Both heaven and earth were on Jesus. All eyes were watching him. He knew that this would be the rapid progress to the final scene at the cross. Jesus knew this. And at the cross, where well, he gave his life as a ransom for all of us. There is no greater love Amen. than the love to give for a man to lay down his life for us. Amen. No greater love. The song says that the cross, at the cross, when I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. Every time you connect with Jesus, all your burdens roll away. Come on, man. And my soul, I was happy all the day because there is no greater love. Now, it was Monday morning, three days after the Passover, when Jesus was coming to the temple to teach. Now, Matthew 21, verse 12, let me tell you. Who got Matthew 21, verse 12? I got a few more. I ain't keep you long now. Just a few more minutes. Matthew 21, 12. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that Amen. sold and bought in the temple and over to the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Amen. Did y'all hear that? Yeah. Let me tell you what Jesus saw. He saw desecration mm -hmm. in his father's house. Money changers. People buying and selling. Come on now, buying and selling in the house of God. People were laughing and talking loud and saying nothing. High-fiving in the sanctuary of God and doing things they ought not to be even doing in the temple, the body temple, or in the church for that matter. He overturned the tables and he cast them out. The sheep, the goats, the doves that they that brought on, that they brought and sold in the house of God. Amen. Jesus cast him out. He did what to the temple? Cleanse. Cleanse the temple. Yes, he did. He cleared his house. Listen to this. Desire of Ages, page 161. I'm getting close to the end. Desire of Ages, page 161. Because of sin, he managed to cease to be a temple of God, darkened and defiled by evil. The heart of men no longer revealed the glory of the divine one separated from God. But by the incarnation of the Son of God, thank you, Jesus, the purpose of heaven is fulfilled. The purpose of heaven is fulfilled. God dwells in humanity, and through his saving grace, the heart of man becomes again the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me ask you something. Are we supposed to follow the example of Jesus when we see desecration in this sanctuary, in this church? It's respecting the holy place, violation on the Sabbath day, profanity in the house of God, sacrilegious use of holy vessels, worldly activities on these holy grounds. The Bible says when we see these things, church, somebody needs to say something. Don't turn the dead back uh -huh. and the deaf ear. Don't turn the dead back. Somebody needs to they say something if they're doing this in the house of God. Somebody needs to say something. And he is telling the last day church, 
to take off that shoes for this place is standing is what? Holy ground. When you see these things in the church and it is unholy things, 